Hey everyone, this is Craig from Asset Horizon and what you're about to watch was an Asset Horizon live event filmed on January 21st, 2024 at Webster's Bookstore and Cafe in State College, Pennsylvania. The name of the event was Plastic Ghosts and Trash Immortals, Our Afterlife as Waste by Nicholas DeWarren. It's about the spectrality of trash and the legacy that we are leaving behind. In fact, we have created our own immortality through plastic waste. Anyway, Nickel is going to tell you about that. The way that this starts out is you're going to see a 90 second clip of the 2010 short film by Rahmin Barani, which is called Plastic Bag, narrated by Werner Herzog. And then after that, it goes right into the philosophical intervention. All right, let's get to it. They told me it's out there, the Pacific vortex, paradise. You may be thinking, hey, shut up and enjoy the sunset, you idiot. Well, I don't care what you think. No one needs me here anymore, not even my maker. Do you know her by chance? Have you seen her? So, with these words voiced, I'm sure you recognize by the inimitable Werner Herzog. I think if Klaus Kinski were alive, it would have been Klaus Kinski and not Herzog, but it's Herzog's voice. So, with these words, Rahimin Brahani's short film, Plastic Bag, begins to tell their life story, the story of a plastic bag. Brahini's short film opens with a setting that I think most of us have seen at some point whether on the beach, on the street, or in an empty field, that most of us have seen at some point without ever think much of it, other than that slight annoyance that somehow this obtrusive little plastic bag is sort of interrupting our romantic moment or interlude. So in a sense, we've all seen the ubiquity of plastic bags as trash without thinking much to do of it. Indeed, without thinking that there's any problem other than getting it out of mind, out of sight. So, because if you think about it, how many discarded things have we seen in our lifetimes, perhaps even today, walking around and seeing disposable objects that seem out of place, even though we know where they belong, which is anywhere but here in, in our world. So, Rahani's film begins with this scene of a crumpled plastic bag discarded on an empty beach with a lament that, in a sense, wants to be heard among the hierarchies of the angels, as the plastic bag laments, no one wants to see, no one needs me anymore, not even my maker. Theirs, the plastic bag is a story, and I encourage you to see the rest of the film. This is just to sort of get you interested, not only in these remarks, which are in a sense a kind of um, insertion or interlude within the film, but theirs is a story which the film tells that begins, like most stories of plastic bags, in a grocery store when a woman once plucks the plastic bag from a dispenser at a checkout counter and with that touch of the plastic bag from the dispenser, much like God gave life to Adam in Michelangelo's Sistine Chapel fresco, the bag comes to life, gains a destiny, gains a meaning. Um, as the plastic bag tells us, I met my maker, I had a purpose. The bag is then brought home carrying the groceries of this woman and it becomes inserted in the routines and the everyday life world of the woman, um, helping her carry groceries, carrying tennis balls to a match, um, and all sorts of other ways in which bags facilitate our everyday existence. And in a moment in the film of kind of touching intimacy, the woman uses the plastic bag to take ice and put it on her sprained ankle, and the bag, who's speaking to us in the film, has a sense of kind of intimacy with the woman. It has entered into a world of purpose. Um, throughout the recolle recollections of this plastic bag, the bag then says, you know, I met her friend, she trusted me. The bag meaningfully participates in a form of life and in that sense is, if you wish, alive. Then at a certain point in the film, the bag is then used for a final act of disposal is thrown away, and as the bag is then carried off to a dump in a garbage truck, 
The bag then recalls its bewilderment at having been abandoned and actually wonders in an act of sympathy whether the woman is worried that it's been lost, much like you would worry that your child or your pet has been lost. You then see the bag make it to a, a dump site, and then from this dump site, then the plastic bag is carried off by a gust of wind, and much like Odysseus in the Odyssey, becomes a wandering homeless ghost who is trying to return home. Um, and in this sense, the film sort of really captures the anonymity of the plastic bag, because though it's the plastic bag that are always telling its life story, asking us to recall and remember the story of this bag, this bag, which is every bag, the woman be is completely anonymous. You never see her face. You never know who her name is. Um, and as the plastic bag then also laments, um, you know, do you know by chance who this woman is? And of course, the point of the Rahamin Brahami film is that we are this person. We are the person who unthinkingly use plastic bags as well as other kinds of items, which then we unthinkingly sort of throw away. So what I'd like to do today is really use this film as a place to, to, to use a kind of more philosophical term, a kind of philosophical anamnesis, a kind of recollection and remembrance of a set of problems that is posed by the massive production of garbage and waste by our societies, which in one sense, no one really thinks about other than the convenience of throwing it away. And most importantly, that no one thinks about philosophically. I mean, the problem of trash can be a technical problem. It can be a social problem, but is it actually a philosophical problem? So part of what I'm trying to do here is to, in a sense, um, uh, formulate the way in which crass becomes a really fundamental problem. Indeed, I'm going to maybe overstate it, the problem of philosophy for the future, much as it is the problem of our humanity. So I'm going to sort of organize my comments in, in different rubrics because I think, as Greg had mentioned, that the part of public philosophy, open philosophy, is to bring philosophy where it belongs, which is in the agora, in the polis, in the public space. So I'll sort of organize these thoughts in various headings, and they will deliberately be very fast. So I'll move very quickly just to cover terrain um, to, in a sense, draw out the contours of the complexity of the problem. So no answers, just problems. And then also to each rubric will be very fragmented or incomplete, and that will be the opening for, for discussion. So I, I first like to just begin with the idea that what this film really shows us is that trash, and here exemplified with plastic bags, is what I will call on the one hand the unthought of our modern form of life. I mean, we don't really think about it. I mean, we see it, we know it exists, but we don't really think about it. So it's sort of the unthought of our modern form of life. But it's also perhaps more saliently what I would call the unthinkability of our culture. There's something fundamentally unthinkable about what, what the accumulation and the production of uh, waste, and here again exemplified with plastic waste, represents. And in that sense, I would suggest that that what makes it a genuinely philosophical problem, the problem that is unthinkable, that then philosophers have to somehow try to figure out how to think, so how to think the unthinkable. So I'll start off with just, again, brief um, elucidations of the problem as unthought. We just take it for granted. And then how part of what we take for granted is because it seems to be unthinkable. It seems to be something we don't really know what to do with as a problem. So here, it's unthought in the sense that much like the plastic bag that we've used or the plastic water bottle, um, plastic items of packaging, in a sense, are diaphanous. And here, you know, the plastic bag is a diaphanous object. We never really see it. I mean, we know it's sort of there. We use it to carry our, our groceries, et cetera. Um, but it's diaphanous in the sense we just see through it. I mean, literally, we see through it. Um, and in that sense, it's an immaterial object that is not really an object of a utility other than a kind of one-time utility which we may reuse or not, and is therefore tied, I think, to something which is really dominant in, in the modern culture, which is centered on plastics, um, and that is the throwability of our culture, that everything is made to be immaterial and throwable. Here, I'd like to show you one image. Um, so, as you probably know, 
modern plastics were invented really in the 20s and 30s, and I'll come back to something about modern plastics. Um, and when plastics were invented, then there was immediately this sense that it's going to fundamentally transform our society. It will make things cheaper. It will make things more efficient. And here, this is from a Life uh, magazine article from the 50s, celebrating throwaway living. Because now, you know, you don't need one water bottle made out of wood or plastic, whatever. You just have that one water bottle made out of plastic, which you use once and you throw away. And here, once he's really this idea that fundamentally things are made to be disposable, where disposability is precisely once you use it, it's gone forever. So it's really about that one-time use, that throwaway use, without any sense of these things having a kind of future. So in that sense, one might say that, and here I'm going to use some technical philosophy jargon since there's some technical philosophy people in the audience. It's neither an object that has a facility of use like a hammer where I use it. I know how to use it. And if the hammer breaks, then I think about how to fix it. So I'll speak German now. It's neither Vorhandenheit nor Zuhandenheit. It's somehow in between. So the packaging that you bought your hammer in doesn't have the utility of the hammer. And it's not an object that has a purposiveness like most objects which have utility. And that's the sort of odd ontological status of packaging. It somehow is useful, but really has no utility other than being useful to, in a sense, no longer be useful. Um, so that's a sense in which it's unthought as it's immaterial. We just don't think about it. We literally see through it. We see the water and we don't see the water bottle. We see the water that now we can use. The second is what I would call the ephemerality of it. It's ephemeral because we think that once we use the water bottle, I see some water bottles here. Daniel has one conveniently as a prop uh, or plastic bags. Once we use it, it's not meant to last. Um, and here it's an interesting sort of um, fact, the origin of trash cans. So, you know, the ubiquity of trash cans. Well, trash cans were invented in the late 19th century by a French guy called Eugène Poubelle. Poubelle is now the French word for trash. Um, because prior to the invention of trash cans, there was this circulation of debris in a society. You didn't have this idea that trash is to be contained in a place that then is the place of forgetting. So precisely, so Eugène Poubelle, when he introduced trash cans in the 1870s in Paris, that was the first metropolitan city that had trash cans, both public and private. One of the catchwords was, um, bien jeté, bien oublié. So, you know, with good conscience, you throw things away in order to forget. So that's the sense in which it's ephemeral. You don't have a sense that all of the plastic goods that you're using, that you used once to have a sip of water, then, and this will be, of course, the theme I want to explore more, then have a kind of afterlife. Um, and then the um, third aspect is precisely then the afterlife, that these objects that we're using in our life world that are in one sense immaterial, that are ephemeral, that it's all about the moment, the moment that allows us to be efficient, um, allows us to, you know, pursue our own goals of life. You know, I can have water whenever I want it, et cetera. I can carry things. But precisely these things then, once we throw them away, we don't have a sense that they have a kind of future. And indeed a future that both implicates us without, in a sense, us being it, feeling that we're implicated in it. Um, and that's the sense in which one can say, my first sense in which plastic objects, and again, I'm just thinking about plastics specifically, are something like ghosts. Uh, they sort of move in and out of our ken. They pass through without any trace or minimal trace of our everyday life. But of course, you can ask yourself, what would we be able to do without a plastic bag or without a plastic water bottle? So in one sense, they enable our form of life to happen, and yet it seems to be completely immaterial and ephemeral. And this is what I would call sort of the dark secret, the dark shame of our culture, the production of waste of which plastics is here exemplary. So that's this first sense in which I want to sort of convince you to speak of plastic things and waste in general as ghosts. Ghosts, not only of the future, they will have an afterlife long after we are gone, but also ghosts that already are in the present. So two senses of the ghost, the ghost in the present, the diaphanous nature of the plastic bag, and the plastic bag, as in Rahim Brahami's film, that will have an afterlife. And this, again, as in his film, is something we just don't think about. We just, you know, use the bag and throw it away. 
So that's a sense of the unthought. And that leads now to the idea that there's also something fundamentally unthinkable about the production of, of, of waste and, and, and plastics. And here, again, I'll use some technical philosophy vocabulary. So the German philosopher Heidegger had this very sort of, you know, powerful argument that what really defines the modern world is technology. That's the essence, that's the metaphysical essence of our world. And technology is not just instrumental, the using of things. It's, in a sense, the ability to harness energy from nature in order to then produce things. So it's really the exploitation of nature and the harnessing of what Heidegger calls the standing reserve. And again, I'll use some fancy German vocabulary. Heidegger calls this the Gestell, which means it's kind of that structure, that apparatus that we don't really recognize exists, but enables our form of life to happen. The fact that we can exploit energy and use that energy for whatever production we need. So I'd like to propose just very briefly that with this notion of the essence of the modern world is technology, that there's another kind of shadow gestell, and that's the production of waste, because there's no extraction of resources from nature that doesn't produce waste. And I'll come back to this in a moment. As you probably know, plastics are made from petroleum. So it requires petroleum or natural gas in order for um, um, uh, plastics to be made. And if one expands the horizon of waste beyond just plastics, but as you probably know, 97% of waste produced in the US is industrial waste and not what is called municipal waste. So every time you think you've done your good eco-citizenship by throwing away your plastic bag, you haven't really done much of anything because the real problem is not you throwing your bag away. The real problem is the 97% of industrial waste. So this is the sense in which it seems to be fundamentally unthinkable. Why unthinkable? Because here I'd like to sort of take a thought that the British theorist Mark Fisher had proposed of what Mark Fisher calls capitalist realism, where he argued that where we are today is in a kind of situation where the future has been canceled. If by the future we mean a fundamentally different form of life than the form of life which we take for granted, which is basically a consumer capitalist society form of life. And Mark Fisher has this really provocative statement that it's easier to imagine the end of the world than it is to imagine the end of capitalism. And that's perhaps why we're so obsessed with disaster movies, because in a sense, it sort of allows us not to imagine that something like our form of life could have an alternative, because the only way we think of our form of life is something that could be destroyed and leave us with nothing else. So here I'd like to propose that trash is also part of this unthinkability, because again, we can't have the form of life that we have without the production of trash and plastics. And that's the sense in which it's fundamentally unthinkable that we could have a world without plastics. Um, and here I'll just show a few more images that there exists a really deep connection, especially in America, between the development of American identity as progress, as democratic, um, as egalitarian, as really the future of, of humankind and plastics. The celebration of, you know, plastics, American as apple pie. So this I took from 1950s magazines. Uh, the world goes plastics. Uh, the Second World War was really important in the development of different kinds of plastics because it was through the, the, the need to make, you know, cheaper, uh, whatever weapons, parts of planes, et cetera. This is, you know, uh, as more blast at the axis thanks to plastic. Right. So the more plastic we made, the more the more we can defeat fascism and communism. So it has this kind of democratic ideal. Um, and the next one, please. And this also, you know, next time you decide to have a baby, as you know, the stork brings your baby. It's going to bring it in cellophane. This obsession with packaging and everything has to be packaged individually because also this paranoia that all of our products are threatened and have to be protected. Um, so if you've ever read Don DeLillo's novel, White Noise, there's this really amazing scene where Jack Gladney is with Murray in the shopping mall. And Murray has this whole thing about the obsession, what he calls the phenomenology of surfaces of packaging. Every fruit is packaged in plastic. So we're obsessed with the packaging of things to protect our valuable stuff without really realizing what this packaging itself is doing. Um, and this is a sense in which also um, the majority of 40% of plastics is actually for packaging. 
Uh, so if ever you, you go to Weiss, you know, every item has to be packaged individually. You come home with 50,000 bags. And so this sense that, you know, even cigarettes, I mean, I love the irony, right? The cancer stick is good for you because it's been protected by plastic. Um, so here, you know, shows what it protects. Yes, it keeps cigarettes so fresh, right? So there's this double sense of the dangerous thing is not seen as dangerous because it's protected by something which seems to be not dangerous. But of course, the plastic itself is a kind of danger, uh, a danger of which we just don't recognize. So that's the sense in which then it's kind of unthinkable. You can't Im imagine the American, let alone the Western, let alone the global way of life without the production of plastics. Um, and that's the sense in which you just, that's, it's, it's fundamentally unthinkable. The other last sense of the unthinkability is one of the interesting things is that there exist many institutions in our world today, both at the international and national level, that tries to figure out how much garbage is being produced. And here, not only plastic, but so-called forever chemicals. There, there exist about 12,000 kinds of forever chemicals, and the name already tells you what characterizes these chemicals. Uh, plastics, there's about 5,300 different kinds of plastics that exist. And then the most aggressive of all is high-level nuclear waste, um, which I'll come back to in a moment, and, and different forms of nuclear waste. But there exist really no reliable... Um, statistics or information on how much garbage is produced a year. So on the one hand, different institutions produce different numbers, but um, these are all very rough sorts of guesses. So it's unthinkable and unimaginable in the sense we just don't know. We just don't know how much garbage is being produced uh, worldwide. And this is further compounded with another kind of issue, which I'll just mention. It's, it's a kind of fascinating issue that part of our obsession with trying to figure out how much garbage is produced involves the classification of garbage, which is also reflected in the obsession with the classification of garbage. Uh, I remember when I first went to Germany in the early 90s, I was completely flabbergasted with the complexity of a German classification system for garbage, which now... I see has come to the U.S. because every time I'm in Sparks, there's like 50 different places, different garbage and, you know, kind of a classificatory confusion. But what actually what the classification of garbage does is it obscures the fact that garbage isn't just about classification of material. It's really a social product produced by a certain kind of society. So again, this is the critique of what's called eco, eco conscientiousness. That somehow if I recycle all my, you know, plastics go here and this goes here, then I've done my job and, and I, I'm helping to solve the problem. But of course the problem is not where these things belong. The problem is our society as such is producing this stuff. Um, but just to give you a sense of the magnitude so every second, so I've been talking now for 15 minutes, you can do the math, 20 minutes. Every second worldwide, four babies are born, two people die, $570 is spent on frozen pizza, don't know why. Uh, 2,300 candy bars are eaten, I understand that. 20,000 plastic bottles are used every second, of which 10,700 end up in the ocean. So every second. So in the 15 minutes I've been talking, you can do the math of how many bottles end up in the ocean. And to give you a sense, 10,700 bottles, so in one second, is about 770 pounds. So 770 pounds of bottles in the ocean, in the ocean, in the ocean. So this will lead me to sort of my last point about the unthinkability. Um, it's not just that we can't imagine a world without plastics. It's, that, it's not just that we can't imagine how much is being produced. We just can't think it. And this is in the sense in which the German philosopher Gunther Anders coined this really interesting idea. And I'll say it in German since we're doing philosophy. He calls it apokalitische Blindheit, which means apocalyptic blindness. That he said that, you know, the paradox of our modern culture which is so suffused by technological progress, innovation, et cetera, is we become blind to the future of effects of our technology. So the apocalyptic consequences, he was thinking specifically of nuclear weapons. He wrote this in the 50s and 60s. But it's a really interesting idea that is precisely we are blind, I would say, not just to the future, but what I will call the future of futures. Because what I think distinguishes modern trash from all previous modern trash, because of course, all cultures produce trash. And if any of you are, you know, anthropologists, you know, the, the majority of archaeological finds 
are trash heaps, trash mounds. So the fact that humans produce trash is, is, is that's what humans do. But I'm going to suggest that we have entered a new age of pr trash production. And that has something to do with the epic temporality of the perdurance of the trash that then implicates and is going to haunt the future, not just the future, but the future of all futures. What do I mean by this? So the plastic bottle that, you know, Daniel has, that will take 450 years, not to pick on Daniel, that will take 450 years to decompose. Um, so just to put it in perspective, uh, how old is the Penn State football team? I looked it up. Uh, <laughs> 137 years, 1887. How old is America, if you take 1776 as the starting point? 248 years. So that bottle will exist longer than the Penn State football team, than thus far America, if America survives the next election cycle. Um, and 450 years ago, what was that? 1574. So that's how long the bottle will decompose. Um, but plastics, as you probably know, actually decompose into microplastics. So plastics, from a chemical point of view, are polymers of chains of molecules that actually don't become reabsorbed. And I'll come back to this in a moment. So the, what happens to plastics is that it breaks down into microplastics. But the plastic molecules themselves are not biodegradable. And in that sense, then plastics have a potential existence at the microscopic scale for tens of thousands, if not millions of years. I think what really sort of brings this home is high-level nuclear waste. So high-level nuclear waste, I mean, there's different kinds of nuclear waste, but the waste that is produced by uranium spent rods, so the production of nuclear energy, that can last up to a million years as being radioactive. So one of the things I'd like to propose is we finally achieved immortality. And it's not, you know, Goethe, Shakespeare, Taylor Swift. I mean, all these icons of culture. Our immortality is have produced materially objects that will exist longer than the species of the human. Um, just to put into perspective, Homo sapiens is 300,000 years old. The modern Homo sapiens is 160,000. So in, in the past 40, 50 years, we have produced millions of tons of objects, artifacts, that will be here for 10, 20, 30,000, 40,000 years when the human being no longer exists. That's insensitive. If on the one hand, what it means to be human is to desire to leave something behind us of value and worth— it's ultimately what children are. That's what culture is. We finally achieve that. It's not our children. It's not, you know, philosophy. It's trash. So with this, I'll come to the next point that I'd like to propose that, you know, this debate today about the Anthropocene, you know, are, are we in a moment where human beings now have entered into the geological record of the planet? So moving from the Holocene to the Anthropocene, because of our intrusion and, and impact on nature, I'd like to propose very briefly to rethink the Anthropocene through garbage and that we are no longer the age of Homo sapiens, Homo faber, it's Homo detritus. That's what defines us. We are defined by what we leave behind. What is it that we leave behind? We're leaving waste behind. That, that is our afterlife. Um, and that then suggests that um, we are moving anthropologically from the hollow scene to the garbage scene, the garbage scene. Um, and that also involves that the Anthropocene becomes decentered from the human because now we have produced these objects that in one sense we, our culture, have made but that these objects are not life, not dead. They're not, you know, they're, they're, they're garbage. It's a kind of non-life. And it's a non-life that will take on its own life. That own life, it's going to be the afterlife of this garbage that we leave behind. Um, so in that sense, we have created a vast expanse of non-life, neither living or dead, which is precisely garbage. And that's, in a sense, the Anthropocene. So with that, then, I'll sort of um, bring these remarks to sort of a somewhat of a, not a conclusion, but a, a point of, 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 of stopping to then go back and show you the end of the film, and then we can talk. So one question of many is, what is garbage? Like, what is it? And specifically, the kind of garbage that I'm going to call is eco-incompatible. So garbage that's not organic, uh, 
that can't be reabsorbed into nature and that is socially produced by a certain industrial society, um, namely ours. So to give it a kind of um, technical philosophy term, I'm interested in the ontology of garbage. Like what is it from an ontological point of view? Um, and so I'm going to suggest four different characterizations of the ontology of modern garbage, which characterizes the age of Homo detritus. And I will call these, just to enumerate them, I'll say a few words about it, the revenant, in French, le revenant. Garbage is that which returns as the ghost. Um, garbage as slow disaster, I'll call it the slow disaster. The extraterrestriality of garbage. And then I'll use the term that is being used by people who are interested in speculative realism, introduced by the French philosopher Quentin Meassou, the Archie fossil. Uh, not the archie fossil of the past, but the archie fossil of the future. So what, what is garbage? And again, specifically modern garbage, uh, plastics, forever chemicals, et cetera. Um, so the first question you could ask is, wait a minute, maybe it's just a metaphor to speak of garbage as ghosts. Uh, that's just a nice metaphor, might sell a few books, but it's not really a ghost because for something to be a ghost, it has to have once been alive and capable of being dead. So only entities that are alive can somehow be caught between the living and the dead. Not only human entities, but also animals, because of course there's a rich literature and, and also in religion of ghosts of animals, ghosts of cats, etc. So how is it that an object, a material object, can be a ghost? It wasn't alive really. So here I'd like to sort of propose that um, Virginia Woolf, in her novel To the Lighthouse, has this really fascinating set of observations on the non-human afterlife of objects and things. So she has this really great description. This is in this, the chapter Time Passes, where she describes the Ram, if you're familiar with the novel, Ramsey's summer home, which they've abandoned for decades. And she has this description about how these objects that have been abandoned undergo their own natural wasting process, a kind of decay sort of a principle of entropy that normally we just don't perceive because it's not the temporality of human interactions. Um, and she has this one description of character entering the room describing, I'll quote from her, mats, camp beds, crazy ghosts of chairs and tables whose London life of service was done. So I find this really intriguing, the idea that, at least according to Virginia Woolf, we can speak of objects as having an afterlife. Uh, and that's kind of the sense in which they're ghosting away, or it's a kind of um, ghost image that is being produced. Um, and that would be different than places that are haunted, because here we can have a whole, you know, the ontology of ghosts, and there are places that are haunted, haunted houses, the Overlook Hotel in The Shining, or in Shirley Jackson. But then there can also be objects that themselves are haunting, and here, if you ever read Rilke's novel, The Notebooks of Maltelori Brigis, I think it's one of the only literary moments I've ever read where a house is haunting people. So it's not that the house is haunted by something. The house itself is moving and appears as haunted or, or, in, um, or in the Howling Castle film by Miyazaki. So the object is the haunting, is haunting, not just haunted. So with that, I'd like to propose that it makes sense to in, sort of in, discover a new kind of category of ghosts, which is plastics and, and other ways, but plastics, um, precisely as something which we throw away, but then returns. And how does it return? It returns in the form of the unfolding slowness of a disaster. So not the event of a catastrophe that all of a sudden happens that we can identify in space and time, but moving away from the ontology of the event and catastrophe to, and here I think the person who first describes this is Rachel Carson in her book Silent Spring, right? The, the disaster that doesn't seem to have any immediate notice, but is slowly unfolding, the pesticides, etc. And then suddenly we sort of see the consequences of it. Just to give you an example of that. So this is on Midway Island. Um, so there's a photographer who maybe 10 years ago went to Midway Island and discovered birds littered dead all over the place um, because so much flotsam, detritus of garbage is floating in the ocean that birds are ingesting it and eating it. And so the more and more they eat, of course, the more and more 
in a one, they, they become polluted, they become contaminated, and, and they die. So this is the unfolding slow disaster in the way in which, in this case, plastics is contributing to the destruction of species. There's also an interesting study that comes out of a group in England who study whales, killer whales, and have discovered that killer whale populations in the past decade have precipitately declined because female reproduction system of killer whales has been interrupted by chemicals. I mean, the tragic irony might be that might happen to us as humans, much like in the movie Children of Men that there will come a point where we can no longer reproduce because our bodies have ingested so many chemicals that inhibits the reproductive system. And then irony of irony, we can't even with Elon Musk escape the planet because you probably know that our planet is contained and orbited by 30, 40,000 pieces of space debris. There's a really interesting NASA site they're trying to track all of that. So that's going to be, you know, we can't reproduce because we've polluted ourselves with chemicals and trash, and we can't escape either because we're locked in a kind of trash, trash hell. Um, maybe the, and so that's the sense which what I call the slow disaster, the slow unfolding disaster, whether it's forever chemicals, plastics, et cetera. The third point is what I would call the extraterrestriality of plastics. So on the one hand, the French philosopher Roland Barthes, in a really interesting essay that he wrote on plastics in, in a collection of essays called Mythologies, it's quite prescient from 1957, um, has this really interesting argument that what plastics actually are and do is that it fundamentally upturns the classical scheme of form and matter. Because traditionally, if you were going to create an object, you had some material, you took wood, and then you shaped that wood according to some sort of plan. So think of Plato's famous analogy, you know, you have the design or the idea of an object, and then you use that object to, to, to make things. Or in Plato's Timaeus, the demigurg who creates the world by looking at forms and imposing that form on content, whether that content is stone or wood. So it's something already given by nature that then we human beings change and fabricate. But Roland Bout argues that with plastics, and here he's thinking of something like injection molding, the form is produced with the matter itself. So there's no pre-existing matter that exists the forming of the form. And so in that sense, the kind of typical philosophical vocabulary of substance and accident, form and content, um, in a sense, has been superseded by the pure potential of infinite transformation and plasticity, which Roland Barthes already sees will be what our culture fetishizes. Everything can be transformed. Uh, Jean Baudrillard says, this is why plastic surgery really epitomizes our culture. You can change yourself in whatever way you want, and that's the celebration of plasticity. Um, so this material, plastics, is extraterrestrial, in the sense that um, it doesn't conform to traditional ontology of nature versus culture, wood as opposed to a design. But as I already alluded to, it's not biodegradable. So the microplastics, the molecules will last basically for forever. And they will just be ingested by animals. So the bottle in, in 450 years is dissolved by microbes. But the plastic isn't from an ontological point of view. So it's as if we produce material that doesn't belong on the earth and that the earth itself could not produce. And this is what makes modern plastics different from Bakelite, I mean, plastics that were discovered in the 19th century. I mean, the, the most extreme example of this is high-level nuclear waste. So high-level nuclear waste, if you remember the Oppenheimer film, in order to produce controlled chain reactions, both for bombs and for nuclear energy, you need to enrich uranium. You need to produce uranium-235, which is not really naturally produced. So though radiation is naturally produced, the kind of uranium and therefore the kind of radiation produced by nuclear energy is unnatural in that sense, what I would call extraterrestriality. Um, the other, another way to think about the extraterrestriality is what are called plastoglomerates. So now geologists have identified new kinds of things produced in the ocean where plastics and rock are fusing into new kinds of objects. 
Um, and these are all over the ocean. These are just some examples. So you can imagine that over time, because of sun, because of the salt, etc., these objects are forming into new kinds of objects, not nature, not culture. And geologists call these plastoglomerates, of which now there's hundreds of different sorts. So that's the sense in which then I'd like to propose that this is extraterrestrial in the sense that it, it's as if it was material that came from outer space. But of course, the outer space is us that we've produced. The last point, and then I'll come to sort of a conclusion or a close, is the Archie fossil. So what I mean by the Archie fossil is how, how will the future remember us? Some of you work in special collections, museums. The Swiss artist Thomas Hirschhorn had this brilliant exhibition a couple of years ago in Switzerland where he was invited to a museum in Basel. And he said, my exhibition, I'm gonna fill the whole museum with trash. That's the exhibition. And of course, the statement is our, the museums of the future of other civilizations that will look back 10,000 years, whatever, or aliens that would come to the earth. How will they remember us? Again, it's not all the wonderful books at Webster's. It's not all the PhD theses that you guys are brilliantly writing. It's not my books, not even this video. It's gonna be trash. Um, and that's a sense in which it's a kind of techno fossil for the future where the future will not really understand wh wh what is this stuff and how it is that we, we could have produced it. Um, here, I would propose that if you're familiar with the great science fiction novel, Roadside Picnic, written by the Soviet brother Strugowski's, it was the basis for Tarkovsky's film, Stalker, Zona in Russian. Uh, it's a really, it's a written in the 70s. I mean, they, they are brothers, one of the great science fiction writers coming out of Soviet science fiction, where the premise of the book, if you've seen the Tarkovsky film, there is a zone where there's these objects with all these mysterious powers and no one knows exactly what these objects are. And then the stalkers are the one who are going in, taking these objects, and then some have beneficial consequences, some don't. Or Jeff Vandermeer, born here in Belafonte, who, you know, don't see the movie Annihilation. It's not that good. The film is much better. Annihilation, which is based on the same premise. It's a science fiction of there's a zone of indiscernible objects and creatures that then we have, you know, a future peoples have to explore. I'd like to propose that this is not science fiction. This is the future. This is how the future will encounter us, the zones of our trash. Um, and that's a sense in which it's an Archie fossil. Namely, it's the ancestrality of the future that is beyond our comprehension and understanding that in a sense we have produced. So with that, I'd just like to end with just one more thought. Um, the one, last slide, please, Craig. So you probably know that this Archie fossil, one of manifestations is the plastic vortex which was discovered maybe 10 years ago in the Pacific Ocean. Um, it's larger than Texas. And it's basically a plastic soup of all these objects that are caught in a current vortex that is building almost a kind of new, new mass of things, which um, in this one sense is out of sight, out of mind, I mean, unless you're an oceanographer, um, and will be in a sense the Archie fossil of the future. If aliens come after our destruction, what will they discover? They will discover this. And indeed, a couple of years ago, this was noticeable from space. So as you know, very few structures are noticeable from space, the Great Wall of China being one of them. The other one is this, um, among others. Um, so this is the sense in which, again, this is the Archie fossil for the infinite future. So in a sense, what I'd like to sort of propose is, it sort of leaves us with at least two questions. One is, the fundamental question of ghosts, and here plastic ghosts and trash immortals, is the ambiguity. The ghost is always asking the question, don't forget me, please remember me. But also at the same time, do I have a right to die? So I think that what ghosts are fundamentally about is the question that they pose to us, calling for a kind of responsibility, the right to remembrance and the right to die. Um, the other question that a ghost always poses to us is the responsibility for an unpayable debt. There is some debt which ultimately we have to act on and be responsible for, but it's fundamentally unpayable. 
Um, but we can't avoid it. I mean, think of Hamlet. I mean, he can, he can, he can act out revenge, but there's always the residue of the unpayable debt. Or if you've ever read Alt Kava Butler's Kindred, right? The, the, the ghost of the slavery past that haunts the present, that there's a debt which is fundamentally unpayable for us in, in the present towards slavery, but in a sense, we have to own up to it. In a sense, that will be the ghosts, plastic ghosts. They are asking us, don't forget us. Don't just throw away and forget us. And why can't we die? Why can't we die? Such that, in a sense, what we could say is that um, what we are producing, and this exemplifies it, is what I call the planetary production of Hades. That's what we're producing. I mean, Hades in the classical sense of the underworld. Um, it's a kind of welter and waste produced by our cultural creations. It's a zone of indiscernibility, like you see here. It's a kind of chthonic realm. I mean, it's straight out of Lovecraft, um, where all sorts of distinctions just collapse, nature, culture, organic, non-organic, human, human. Um, it's kind of like a gigantic thing or blob in your worst horror movie, um, lurking at the outermost periphery. It's out there somewhere. Um, it's mobile and self-proliferating because we are proliferating it. Um, and it really represents the dark secret of our civilization, what I'm calling the planetary production of Hades, the netherworld that shall endure long after we ourselves as a species have departed from the earth as the singular momentum mori of our finitude, of our conspicuous stupidity and our consumptive narcissism. I made it to the vortex. I was with my own kind. We covered an area the size of a small continent. We were free and happy. I loved going in circles, in circles, in circles. But no one here thought about anything. I grew restless. And I started to think about her again. So I spun around so fast that I was free. But I was quickly trapped. I have no idea how long ago that was. Over time, I came to like these monsters. Isn't that one beautiful? Did my maker exist? Or had I created her in my mind? Why were my moments of joy so brief? And yet, like a fool, I still have hope I will meet her again. And if I do, I will tell her just one thing. I wish you had created me so that I could die.